Hello, everyone. My name is Giancarlo Petiti. As Gavin said, I'm an application engineer at MathWorks. And I, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about how, you can, uh, how model based design can help you to develop motor control applications. So, electric motors are finding more and more applications every day, they're everywhere. Uh, and the technology to control these motors is, oh, sorry, yeah, the, the technology to control these motors is evolving to target new hardware and software platforms. Um, given that, you know, that, that trend, the, it's more and more important for the hardware and the software engineers to work closely together in the development of those algorithms. So my aim in this session is to um, hopefully show you how, um, well, first, first of all, what some of those challenges are and what some of the solutions are, and how Simulink is a great platform for doing development of motor control applications for hardware and software um, through enabling three things. Uh, first of all, it gives you an environment where you can simulate the hardware and the software and the motor all in, all in one environment. Um, second of all, it allows you to make smarter design decisions about things like how you partition your, your designs, which bits should run on the hardware, which bits should run on the software. And finally, as we've just heard, being able to automatically generate the implementation code, be it to C or to HDL. Um, and that allows you to kind of reuse the same models when your target hardware changes. Okay, so I want to illustrate this workflow, this process, using an example that we built in-house in MathWorks. Um, so I'll talk about this in a bit more detail later, but the setup that we had was um, the development board with an FPGA and a microprocessor on it, um, some interface board for talking to the motor that we're controlling down at the bottom, um, that was coupled through a mechanical coupling to another motor that's acting as a dyno. And we've got this cable here, which is a, an encoder cable to give us a very accurate position measurement that we're going to feed back into our controlled algorithm. What we can see on the right-hand side here is the top is, is the, the results from a simulation of running a, a closed-loop velocity test in our Simulink simulation on our desktop. Um, I'll talk about that a bit more as well. But what you should see underneath is the same test being carried out on the real physical hardware using the, same, using the algorithms from the above uh, simulation deployed through code generation onto that um, platform. So I'm going to split my talk into three sections today. First of all, why use hardware and software for, for motor control? Um, second of all, how does model-based design help with some of those challenges? And thirdly, I'll go into this case study in a bit more detail to show how you might apply it, what are the steps you might take. So let's start with, with the why. What are the, what are the reasons why it's becoming important to use both hardware and software? So a key trend is that the requirements for the performance of the motor drives keeps on increasing. Um, in order to meet those requirements, it's um, often a very, the most cost-effective way is to increase the, al the algorithmic content of the control. Use more complex control algorithms to squeeze more performance out of the, the physical hardware that you've got. A consequence of that is that you need more computing power to run these more advanced algorithms. We just heard earlier about how you're trying to do more on the same bit of hardware, and you're, you're therefore looking to kind of be efficient in your, in your implementation. So what are some examples of those, those advanced algorithms? What's driving people this way? So field-oriented control is a, is a technique to get more power out of um, you know, variable speed motors, the kinds that you would find in like a handheld electric drill, for instance. In sensorless motor control, you're taking on, taking on more, adding in more algorithmic complexity to um, model the um, velocity or position of the motor. Um, so that you can eliminate a sensor. Right? So your control algorithm now incorporates a model of the behavior of your motor to estimate the position. Um, in variable frequency drives, like the kind you find in an electric train, for instance, torsional vibration is a, can be a real problem. Um, the coupling between the motor, the gearbox, the clutches can all lead to um, vibrations that cause expensive components to wear. So if you can incorporate vibration detection and suppression algorithms into your motor control system, you can extend the life of your project, of your product, sorry, reduce maintenance costs, that sort of thing. 
And finally, where you have more and more motors, such as in multi-axis control, this robot arm you can see here, it's often um, I ideal if you can collect all of the control for those multiple motors and, and encapsulate them on one device so that you don't have multiple, the part cost of multiple control units spread around to, to do this control. So given that we've got more complicated algorithms, where are people turning to? What hardware they are they using in order to gain the performance that they need to realize their designs? So for people doing C code development, we see lots of people taking advantage of multi-core processors, or as things really scale up, multi-processor systems. Or as, we, as we've just heard as well, you know, taking advantage of hardware, the highly parallel nature of FPGAs or of ASICs to really get the, the speed performance that you need. But it's also more and more the case that you don't just want to pick one or the other, you want to get the best of both worlds. So we're seeing system-on-chip devices being, becoming more and more popular as a place to run your algorithms. System-on-chip is, is a kind of catch-all term that, that doesn't just mean an FPGA and a microprocessor, but could include other bits of hardware like GPUs, um, particularly where you have vision applications. You might want to run the vision processing algorithm on the GPU. Um, the kind of takeaway from all of this is that in order to get a good design, the hardware and the software need to be implemented or designed together. The good news is that for all of these things that, you've, um, that I've listed here, you can generate code from them for code from them using MathWorks tools. So we've we've heard from um, the previous speakers about using um, or developing motor control applications for for the fin for fin actuation. Um, I wanted to point you at another kind of use case that you might find interesting. So these guys, uh, Punch Powertrain, spoke at the expo last year in Benelux and talked about. Um, the development of a new kind of control algorithm for a new type of electric motor that, was, that they wanted to use in a project. Um, you can go on the website, you can view this video, this is just a screenshot for it, but I wanted to bring it up and bring it to your attention because it encapsulates some of the um, things that I've just been talking about, right? So their next generation motor, the speed that they wanted to run it at was 20,000 RPM. Their previous motor was only 10,000 RPM that had an impact in terms of the constraints on the performance of their algorithm. To control this motor, they needed to drive current through the coils at, was it 8,000 amps per millisecond? Um, you know, I can't even fathom what that really means, but it's a you know, very fast rate. So the result is that you, know, you need, the, the, the timing constraints on their algorithms were tighter. They needed to have more complex algorithms to control the motor to get the performance. They needed to move to a new kind of of device to run those algorithms. So I'd encourage you to go and take a look at this example. Um, it's it's a, great, a great case study if this is your area. So I want to pick up on, on one of the aspects of that from that previous case study that I mentioned, which is they used a FPGA system on chip. They used a zinc device. Um, so I want to kind of just kind of take a peek at inside what, what does that look like and use that as an uh, uh, as an opportunity to illustrate some of the challenges that arise when you're using these kinds of, um, of devices. So inside an FPGA system on chip, you've got a microprocessor core that could be an ARM processor, um, which is pretty powerful and, and flexible. You, use, you program it with your C code, as you would expect. You also have some FPGA fabric that you can um, run very computationally intensive tasks at a very high rate. Between them, you've got some kind of um, shared memory or, or high-speed interconnect for exchanging data. And around the outside, you've got some configurable I.O. and peripherals and, and, and so on. So the first, one of, one of the first challenges that, that springs to mind is what part of your algorithm do you run on the processor and what part of your algorithm do you run on the programmable logic? How do you, how do you split things up? And then, even, if that's, even once you've made that decision, getting an efficient implementation for how these two bits of the system talk to each other and exchange data can be time consuming, can be, can be tricky. If you can um, address those challenges, then, you've, then you're in a really good situation because you can choose where to run your algorithms to get the best overall performance or to get the, get the design to a implementation in the quickest time. 
Right? It's not just about running the algorithms where they run fastest. It's about running them where it makes it, it where it makes most sense for you to design them. So, to kind of to summarize, a, a, a motivation for why you need to use mo both hardware and software for motor control applications is in order to meet increased performance, but also deliver your projects on time and on budget. You need to develop more complex algorithms, and you need to run them on the right hardware. So that means running your algorithms on a processor, if that makes sense for, for to, if that's the right place to run the process, to run the, that bit of the algorithm, run it on an FPGA, if that makes most sense, run it on a GPU, if that makes most sense. Okay. So hopefully that's given a bit of motivation as to, as to why those, these two components are both necessary. That brings us to the next question of why use model-based design for motor control? How does that help? So let me recap those challenges. Firstly, given that advanced motor control algorithms will require both hardware and software, um, integrating those two parts of the algorithm needs collaboration between algorithm developers, embedded software engineers, system engineers, all working together. Implementing motor control algorithms is complicated by the fact or difficulty or effort in actually getting tests running on hardware. Hence, you would go to hardware in the loop or emulated hardware. The other part on this one is, how do you, how do you test your algorithms if you don't have the hardware to test? But also, um, do you really want to be testing your prototype algorithms with your very expensive prototype hardware if you might break it? Right. And then th the, third, the third challenge is, how do you make design decisions given that these decisions are going to have an impact across the whole team? You know, splitting the algorithm between hardware or software has a, has a profound impact on what those teams are going to deliver. Also, decisions about should this be fixed point or floating point you know, it also affects what they're, what they're going to produce at the end of the day. So how does model-based design help? Well, in the first instance, um, with model-based design, simulation is the platform for doing the development process. And it allows engineers to um, take their system level requirements and build simulations to validate the specifications way before any hardware is, is ready. It allows you to try out new ideas, try out um, your algorithms with new types of motors way in advance of any, any hardware testing. Second of all, because everyone's using the same environment, the same Simulink models, everyone in the team can collaborate and communicate in the same, in the same way. It allows the hardware and the software engineers to see the impact of their design decisions on the rest of the system before even committing to implementing it. And finally, um, because you can automatically generate the code from your, um, your, your design models quickly, it means that your time spent in the lab is more about confirming the behavior of your, of your models and validating that. That enables you to do more um, work back in simulation because you can then, you can then quickly evolve, um, iterate on those design changes, produce a new implementation, and te test it on some real hardware. So ultimately, you are going to want to get your algorithms running on some hardware with a real motor and see it, see it work, right? To, to confirm that what you've designed in simulation gives you what you need it to. This is kind of where you want to end up, your kind of production system. Okay, so you've got um, some parts of your algorithm written in C code running on a microprocessor, other parts implemented as HDL on a FPGA, for instance, talking to the motor and the rest of the system. But that's not the only pieces of the puzzle that you have. You've got all these other bits. You've got the, the code or the infrastructure that allows you to communicate between your, your processor and your FPGA. You've got the code that does other peripheral control or other interfaces. And the, all that other stuff can really slow down the development process um, bef you know, before you get to actually testing your code with, with some real hardware and seeing a motor turn, for instance. Um, if you need to get down at this level and, and have help from teams that are actually effectively producing a production implementation, that can really slow things down. Put that to one side. That's where we're going to want to end up. Our starting point in model-based design is going to be a simulation. Okay? It's going to be a set of algorithms, um, that some of which are going to be in code, some of which are going to be in HDL, and a model of the motor, 
and we can rapidly iterate our design until we're happy with how the system performs. Then when we want to go to that production hardware, we can generate the code, be it with embedded coder or HDL coder, and integrate that into the rest of the system. But that still doesn't address the challenge of how do I do that without committing to getting help to write all of this other infrastructure for some production hardware. So you can take a, an intermediate step. Okay, so with the support provided within the tools for um, a bunch of different prototyping devices, some, some, some of these system on chip devices, you can take an intermediate step of generating your C code and your HDL code, but getting for free the interfaces between, between the two th um, systems, if you like, on the chip. Um, that enables you to, to get from the desktop, from your models to the hardware, and see a motor spinning and, and validate that your algorithms are doing the right thing in, in real time on the hardware. When you're happy with how that performs, then you can take the same C and HDL code, pipe it into your downstream tools specific for your hardware, and in, incorporate it. But you don't have to go to all of the effort of doing all of these other low-level interfaces until you're happy with how your system performs. Having hopefully motivated some of the reasons why model-based design can help with some of the challenges I discussed earlier, let's take a look at how model-based design can, can help. All right, so just to, to recap what I showed earlier, this is the, the hardware setup that we had. We've got a system on chip, um, control board connected to a motor um, that we're controlling that's coupled to a dyno, so we've got, so we've got something to test against, um, and the encoder to provide the feedback for the position. So I want to talk you through the kind of the high-level workflow that we followed to, to do this, and then go into a bit of detail on some of the, on, the, on the steps along the way. So the starting point for all of this is a desktop simulation. Right? We need to build a test bench that allows us to simulate our algorithms with our, with our motor and our dyno models. When we're happy with how that system performs, we can go ahead and take our model that we're going to target to our FPGA, generate some HDL code, integrate that with the rest of the framework needed to run that on the FPGA. With the C model, we can generate the C code and put that inside its framework that it needs to run on the processor, and then deploy that to the embedded system and connect it to the, to the motor, and, and away we go. So let's start with the, the system level model. Okay, so this is, this is our simulate model that we're going to simulate that has our system inputs, our test cases, if you like, test vectors, uh, the control algorithm connected to the model of the, of the motor, the physical system, and then something that we're going to verify the outputs. And this, uh, on the right-hand side, is the same scope that we sh saw earlier. And all being well, we'll see the simulation progress. So we hit play on the Simulink model, and it runs through the simulation, showing, first of all, the calibration stage, where it's calibrating the encoder, then into closed-loop velocity control, going through different set points, and we can look at the, the current in the different phases to see how that, um, how that performs. You can bring the data into the simulation data inspector to do a bit of visualization or comparison, um, and we can see um, that the motor is performing you know, well, as we would expect, um, having gone through a design cycle. And we can pick up things like um, you know, and, uh, in closed loop mode, the phase currents are a lot lower than when we're running in open loop mode at the start, trying to, trying to turn the motor and, and find the encoder index. All right, so we'll come back to this later to see how, when we implement this and, and run this on some real hardware, how do the results from that real hardware match our simulation? Okay, that's what gives us confidence. So this is, the, this is the first step, but already there might be some questions that you've got in your head. How do I get a good model of a motor? How do I make sure that it matches real-world behavior? So maybe you've got a, you know, an understanding of how you might address some of these questions from talks you've been to earlier today. Um, but let's start by drilling in, looking inside our motor model and, and seeing what's in there so we can figure out what we need to do. So here's our, a screenshot of our Simulink model of our, of our system. Let's go inside the motor and load subsystem and see what's inside there. So in here we've got... Um, blocks that represent the PWM peripherals, the inverter, the, a model of the PMSM, the, the machine that we're controlling, 
the dyno coupling and, the, and the, another motor model for the load with other blocks that represent things like the current sensors, the encoder, and how they behave. And at this stage, you can pick the level of fidelity that makes sense for what you're trying to simulate and, and find out about your system. So let's go inside the, the PMSM model and see what's underneath there. So here we can see we've got some, some Simscape blocks in here, a block that represents the, the motor itself, the, phys, the equations that govern its physics, and some other, um, other blocks related to, on the mechanical side, the inertia and the friction, um, and some additional resistances and external uh, um, components on the electrical side. So let's kind of drill, keep drilling down. Let's focus on the motor and see what's underneath there. So at this stage, this is a Simscape block from the, from the Power Systems Library. And there are no more blocks underneath, right? So this is a component that we can just take and drop into our model and use. But we still need to provide some information to make it represent our system, our motor. So here we have all of the parameters that we need to input. For the motor, it's things like number of pole pairs, um, resistances, inductances, and so forth. But then there are other parameters that we need to find as well, like um, friction parameters or inertias that we might not know. So how do we find the parameters that we need for this model? All right, so the thing that I want, to take you, I want you to take away from this is it's quite easy to build up a, a motor model because you can use the predefined blocks in Simscape. But you st your challenge is more around how do you parameterize it to match your real system. OK, how do you find the right motor parameters? So I've got a few suggestions, things that you might want to try. Um, you might be fortunate enough to work in an, an organization that not only does motor control but designs motors as well, in which case you might be able to go and ask your colleague for the parameters that you should use. More likely, you might be turning to manufacturer's data sheets to extract from there the parameters that you can plug into your model. And that's the, you know, the way the Simscape models are designed. There should be kind of reasonable um, match between what you want to put in the model and what's available on a data sheet. But sometimes that's not always the case. And you might have to go and do some direct experiments on the bench or perform some tests to collect some data you can use to try and match your parameters. So, I want to talk you through a few steps that you could do to find the parameters for a motor, um, and then I'll look uh, at, at, at some alternatives. OK, so the first thing you can do is a locked rotor test. So this is where you stop the motor from turning, and you um, apply a voltage, and you see what current you get as a, as a result. What you'll see from this image is that you can, I can describe that experiment that you do on a bench, and you can build a, a Simscape model that actually does the same experiment in, in simulation, so you can see quickly how your results match. So from performing this test, you can identify the stator resistance and the inductance okay, from the various properties of, of the curve that you get. Okay, And we'll take those parameters, and we'll use them for the next step. Um, so if we... Um, leave our, our motor open circuit and apply a rotational velocity to the motor, we can get what, figure out what the back EMF constant is and hence what the torque constant is. Next, um, you can plug in a simple motor control algorithm just to get the motor spinning and be able to control it to different speeds. From those different, um, you can measure the current at those different speeds, use the torque constant you've calculated to work out what the sum of the, the friction and the damping torques are. So you can then plot them out like this. And um, from the torque at zero speed, you get the, the friction term. And then from the gradient, you can calculate the, the damping coefficient. Finally, you can have your motor running at a, at a constant speed, and then basically disconnect the phases and see how it coasts down. From that coast down test, you can calculate the inertia of, of the motor. So those are some kind of four steps you could, you could do to calculate some discrete parameters for your model. But you might not have the, the time or the setup to do them, or there might yet be more parameters that you need to, to figure out what, what they should be. So another approach is to use optimization techniques. So you can perform an experiment on your, on your benchtop, and provide some input stimulus, measure the response of the system, and then take that input and output data 
and apply it to a, to a simulation of your system and say to a tool like Simulink Design Optimization, go away and find me the set of parameters that cause my model to match the real world data. Um, and of course, you can apply some engineering knowledge to this to constrain the ranges of given physical parameters to, to make sense and help the, thing, help the optimization along. So here's a little video of, of what I'm talking about. So down at the bottom, you can see the voltage input. So it's just a square wave voltage to a DC motor. And on the top, you can see in blue the measured uh, speed of the motor from an experiment. And in orange, you can see the simulated results um, from our initial starting point, our model with its default parameters. So we want to make those two curves match. So we can create our experiment in Simulink design optimization and say, go away and find these five parameters. So we've got um, damping, inertia, torque constant, inductance, and resistance. And it's going to simulate that motor a bunch of times and um, calculate what is the best trajectory to take those parameters to improve the match between simulation and reality. And then through a number of iterations, we can see it converges to a point where we get very close match. Um, and, and we now have a set of parameters we can use in our model that we know give us a good, a good correlation between reality and, and simulation. So we've now, hopefully, built up a model of a motor that matches reality and we can have some confidence in. But we're still left with developing the algorithms. How do I get started developing these algorithms if I've not done it before, if I'm looking at a new type of motor, or I'm looking to add in new functionality that is, you know, the algorithm might be new to you as well. So one place I would encourage people to look is, well, try looking for an example that already exists. So within Embedded Coder, there are examples of um, field-oriented control algorithms that you can not only simulate, but you can deploy and test on some real hardware. Um, if you went along to the physical modeling um, demo station earlier, you might have seen an example of taking a, a model and generating code to run on a, on a DSP to control a motor. Within HDL Coder as well, there are also examples of doing current control, for instance, that you can generate the HDL for and synthesize and, and, and test. And within Simscape power systems, there are lots of other examples of different um, types of motors and different ways of controlling them that you can use as a starting point to, to build up your own algorithms that you're going to use, and take it towards a, um, an implementation. So it's worth pointing out that um, in the latest release in Simscape, there are, um, and particularly Simscape power systems, I should say, there are a bunch of different um, control elements that you can use and reuse in your, in your designs. So common blocks that might help you get started or kind of um, you can just take and reuse for things like mathematical transforms, Park and Clark transforms, um, or kind of whole control algorithms that you could use, or even kind of schemes for um, prov producing the PWM signals that you need for, for an inverter or the like. Hopefully that gives you kind of a feel for what you can use to get started building up your algorithms and connecting them to uh, a, a decent plant model. So now we kind of really start to get into the, into the nitty gritty. We, we're, we're getting to the stage where we have a simulation on our desktop that does, does what we want it to do. But now we need to get away from the desktop and onto some hardware. But before we can do that, we need to make some decisions and apply some detail to the implementation to, to help realize that. So which parts of my algorithm should be in C code? Which parts should be in HDL, for instance? Should they be in fixed point or should they be in floating point? As I said earlier, these are questions that will have a profound impact on what people actually have to do and produce in the project. So particularly with the partitioning idea, th this is a question that people have been struggling with for, for a, a long time. And you know, there isn't a hard and, hard and fast rule, but there are some strategies that you can employ to, to make some sensible decisions. And I'll show you how, um, how model-based design can, can help in some of those instances. So experience is the, is the first place. To, to start, or I should maybe call this prior knowledge. Right? So you might know from your requirements on your control scheme that there are some timing constraints that you know. So 
for instance, you might know that your current control loop has to operate at 25 kilohertz, and trying to do that on the microprocessor would be a struggle. That, that kind of pushes you towards implementing that on, an, on the FPGA. A common technique that um, people do is generate C code for, for everything, put it on a microprocessor and profile it, see what takes a long time, um, see where those bottlenecks are, and then ask the question, could you move some of those bits to, to hardware to realize it? So model-based design can help with that because from your Simulink model, you can automatically generate the code. You can run it in processor in a loop mode on some hardware and profile it and get the results back into Simulink and then figure out where in your model do you need to draw the line to, to put that onto, onto the FPGA, for instance. I should say as well on, that, on this one, because you can automatically um, generate the code, you're not committing to a long design cycle just to get some data to back up your decisions. Okay. Another strategy is put your algorithms where the data comes in. If you have some sensors connected to some inputs or some um, ADCs, for instance, and they're, going, they're piping that data directly into the FPGA, then it makes sense to process that data where it comes in and then pass that process data somewhere else if it needs to go there. The idea being that you want to minimize the data transfer. Stop, you know, don't, don't spend your, your processing time pumping data around, um, for example. And then the, the last point is continuously monitor the, the resource usage as you're evolving your design and move things around when you are near the limit. So again, with the code generation tools, when you generate the implementation code, we can tell you some, some information about your code. For C code, we can look at the static code metrics. RAM and ROM usage or stack size, for instance. For HDL code, we can also provide you some met metrics about the resource usage that implementation um, requires. Let's go back to our, our example before, and, and, and I'll, I'll talk you through what did we do to, to partition up this algorithm. So we took our control algorithm, and we split it into some bits that were going to run on, on the processor, some on the FPGA. The bits that run on the FPGA, um, we knew that the current control loop had to be at 25 kilohertz, so that's... Ah, there you go. That's that bit there. And we also knew the current sensing and the encoder feedback was coming in directly to the FPGA, so that's, that's there as well. Finally, the output PWM signals that were going to the, the, the FMC board, they're on the FPGA as well, so we'll implement that bit of the algorithm on, on there. Everything else had lower speed requirements of a kilohertz or so and could be could be implemented on the processor in C code, um, and you know, that's where it made most sense to, to, to perform those, those algorithms. So we'll target the mode, the supervisory logic, and some of the, the open loop or the, the velocity control loops on the, on the ARM processor, and everything else we'll put on the FPGA. Um, so having split our algorithm up like this, what we can also do is now simulate the, the impact of partitioning that algorithm on our control scheme. So you can see um, in this model, we've got blocks that represent how data is being delayed or the transition between something running in a fast rate and a slow rate, and see if that has any impact on the closed loop control properties of our, of our design. And if that's providing problems, then we can readjust our design and, and repartition it. OK. The next question is, um, Floating point or fixed point? If you're going to implement things in hardware, is it always necessary to use fixed point maths? Um, possibly. In order to meet resource constraints on your, on your hardware, you might have to go to fixed point. Um, if you do need to go to fixed point, then there are tools like the fixed point designer that helps you to automate that conversion process between something in floating point and fixed point. And I'll show you a little example of that in a minute. But then the next thing is that the other part of this is that you can generate native floating point HDL code with HDL coder. So you don't have to generate fixed point implementations. So with, with HDL coder, you can take your floating point algorithm. If you need to or want to convert it to fixed point, you can use the fixed point designer to help, with, help you do that. And then use HDL coder to produce an implementation. Or you can directly take your floating point algorithm and produce native floating point so that you can run that on any FPGA or take advantage of any, uh, some floating point IP on your, on your target hardware and 
generate floating point HDL code for that. So you may be able to skip a stage in your design process overall. So let's come back to generating a, an efficient fixed point design from a floating point model. So here is a slightly different example model from before, but, but we basically have a, um, a model that we want to implement, and in the top right you can see the scope window that has our desired response that we get from running our, our floating point simulation. Now our job is to convert that into fixed point and try and preserve this behavior whilst getting a, a, an efficient implementation. So what we can do is we can take this um, component, this subsystem, if you like, and bring up the fixed point tool to help us convert that into, into a fixed point design. All right, so from the context menu, you can choose the fixed point tool. This will bring up another window. And from here, we can, first of all, collect range information about the ranges of signals in our simulation by overriding it with all double precision. So we can simulate it, see what, what happens. Um, then the next thing is to say, well, what's, what would we like our default word length to be? It could be 16 bits for a microprocessor or something more exotic for an FPGA. In this case, we'll put it to 16. And then we, um, we can ask the tool to propose us some data types for the various different signals in our design based on the range data that we collected before. We can then go on and analyze by looking at these histograms for different signals, what is the, um, you know, are there any potential overflow or underflow conditions that we might, might see and adjust things if, if necessary. Finally, we can apply those data types that, we've, that the, the tool has helped us with and then run the simulation using those fixed point data types. From having run that fixed point simulation, we now want to compare that against our original floating point design to ensure that we've not um, lost anything or got any, any strange behaviors from overflows or wraps or that sort of thing. So we can load the data into the simulation data inspector and compare the, the floating and fixed point signals. Um, if, you, if you want to, you can apply some tolerance, some global tolerance to say, um, I, I know I'm going to have some quantization effects from um, doing this conversion, but I'm happy with a small amount. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about adding further implementation detail for HDL. Likewise, I'm not going to talk about what code generation optimizations you could do to get and add, to add implementation on that. But, it, but suffice it to say, for HDL code generation, you are going to need to add some more things, so, so some more registers or do some work for pipelining purposes to get an efficient design. This is our, our HDL implementation model. And you can see we've got a whole bunch of delays on the input and the output that will correspond to registers in our design. Um, I do want to draw your attention to the fact that HDL Coder does help designers with doing a lot of this implementation detail. So things like automatic delay balancing um, or clock rate pipelining help you to kind of real, get, get to a, uh, an implementation that is efficient and makes best use of the resources you've got available to you whilst still giving you the correct answer that you're expecting. All right. So we're now to the stage where we've split up our model. Um, we've done any fixed point to floating point conversion that we might need. We've added in some implementation detail. We can generate code from these models. Okay? And as I was talking about earlier, when I generate code, um, I not only get the, the C code, but I can also get um, metrics reports about the implementation I've just produced in terms of global variables or so on on the, on the C or with the HDL code report as well about the, the resource usage that that implementation will, will require. So I've, I've generated some C code, but now I need to get that onto my prototyping hardware to make a motor spin. And as I was saying earlier, there's all this kind of interfacing between um, uh, the, the hardware and the software, how do I get that to work just so I can prove out my design? So again, with these um, support packages for system on chip that, that, that we can provide, there's a, there's a route that's really helpful. Okay? So when we generate the, the HDL code from our HDL model, at the same time as doing that, we can generate an interface model that has all of, your, all of the interfaces set up and pre-configured for you, so you drop that into your C code model. So 
when you generate the HTL code, it goes into the tools that you need to program the FPGA. Um, we pop out a, a software interface model that you can replace your FPGA or sorry, your HTL model with in your system. And then you can download that bitstream to the, the FPGA board and you can go ahead and build your Simulink model with your C code implementation. But furthermore, we can, we can do more stuff as well, right? So we can provide you a link back from your hardware to your Simulink model so that as you're running your Simulink model, it's talking to the hardware over some communications device so you can see what's going on inside your algorithm running on the hardware. You can, you can get back measurement data or you could change parameters if you want. Or if you run in process in a loop mode, for instance, you can perform profiling, that sort of thing. So this provides you with a real, really powerful capability for de debugging what's going on in your implementation to make sure it's working correctly. So let me show you another video of how this, how this will work. All right, so, so we've already programmed our FPGA with the HDL model that we produced earlier. This, this block over here is the interface model for the communication between our processor and our FPGA that was automatically produced as a byproduct of that process. This is our contr C control algorithm that we had in our system level model just referenced here in this, in this model. All this other stuff here is, the say, is, is a test bench that we're going to embed on the ARM processor so we can reproduce on the hardware the same test that we did in simulation. So if I run this video, at the top you can see this is running in external mode. When you press play, the code is generated, it's built and put down onto the processor, and now you'll be able to see the motor spinning. Here we go. And you'll be able to notice this display updating in real time as the simulation is running, as the data is coming back. Because we've set up the logging in our simulate model whilst it's running in external mode, we also can measure back the phase current from what you know, that was seen on the ARM processor. So what we've got here is, is we're overlaying the, the simulation results that I showed you right at the beginning with the, the results from running on the hardware. And you can see that they, you know, they match really well. The only difference is down here in this bottom position. And the reason why they don't match up is because in simulation, we're always starting from a precise um, angle of our motor, if you like. We, we know where our encoder is. In, in the real world, the motor is starting from an arbitrary position, so its, it's initial encoder um, calibration phase might, might look different on the real hardware. OK, so I've covered some motivation for why you might want or might need to use hardware and software in motor control applications. I've talked about how model-based design can help with some of those um, challenges. And I've gone through a bit of a case study for some of the steps in the process that you might use to develop motor control algorithms. So I just want to finish with re re kind of reiterating those three points that model-based design enables you to simulate your complete system way in advance of getting any hardware. It allows the algorithm developers, the hardware engineers, the embedded software engineers to all communicate using this, a common language and see the impacts of their design decisions on the complete system rather than waiting to you integrate and test later on. And finally, the ability to automatically generate code um, means your design iterations can be quicker and you can um, spend less time doing hardware debugging and testing in, in the lab. Use the time in the lab to validate your models and get, gain confidence and move things up, in, up into the desktop. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.